This is the symposium. I started planning this along with my colleague at Tech, Michael San Francisco, who was a student of, a grad student of Lynn's at BU. He's been at Tech for a long time, as I have also been. And uh, so we thought, uh, I, and I met Lynn at Texas Tech when uh, Sankar Chatterjee, uh, who's here in the audience with us, uh, brought her in in 2005. And so Michael and I thought, well, it's been enough time. Let's bring Lynn back. And we began planning a meeting that would be a symposium, a small kind of meeting. Uh, and uh, so I had a chance to ask her who, uh, who she'd like to hang out with if we could get this meeting to happen. And a lot of those people are on the program. Uh, and uh, happily, Dorian will come and be part of the event as well. Email me, I'll send you the, uh, the PDF and you can post it where you are. And, and so it's free and open to the public. Uh, you just got to get yourself to Lubbock, Texas uh, in September, so bring your swim trunks. Uh, it's as early in the semester as it is because in the original planning we wanted to get Lynn to Lubbock uh, early enough that my swimming pool would still be running. Uh, and so, uh, anyways, uh, that's the story on that. Well, cultural influences, so basically, uh, uh, well, I'm a literature person uh, and so uh, I'm culture, uh, as opposed to science, I suppose. This is just kind of Lynn's influence on me and a certain side of how it came about. So for this panel on Lynn Margulis' cultural influences, I'll begin by telling one part of the story of her influence on me, on my intellectual convictions as I've had occasion to bring them to bear as a scholar of literature and science. I'll tell the story of my own conversion to Gaia theory. Doing so will bring out a view of autopoietic Gaia, the divergent form Gaia theory takes in Margulis's later presentations, and a plea for its incorporation into Gaia theory going forward. Margulis's autopoietic description is also the form in which Gaia finally got through to me since that moment, I've been a vocal proponent of Gaia theory, critical and selective disciple, I hope. But for a long time prior to that, I was reluctant to take it seriously. Meeting Lynn Margulis in the fall of 2005 and then in the fall of 2006, spending two weeks at her lab after attending a conference in her company, titled The Gaia Theory Model and Metaphor for the 21st Century, directed by Martin Ogle at George Mason University, and happily Martin's also here with us today. The, all these things certainly clinched my change of mind, but my epiphany proper, the moment of intellectual conversion from vague skeptic to Gaian thinker occurred after a long preparation just before those first personal contacts tripped by an encounter with her memoir, Symbiotic Planet. So in other words, as it would happen with the literature person, it was her book that, that made it click for me. But before that, even after more than a decade of cultivating a post-tenure academic specialization in literature and science, as a professor in a department of English, reschooling myself in the histories of physics, chemistry, and biology, coming up to speed on chaos and complexity theory throughout that period in the 1990s, where Gaia was concerned, not much came to hand. I absorbed the usual nebulous and unexamined notion that Gaia was not quite real science, but some new age notion connected to goddess worship or God knows what. I took it to be the sort of idea that I, as an interloper into the discourse of the sciences, were I to establish or maintain some minimal credibility in the academy, should avoid, you know, just as one should avoid contact with bacteria, since 
you know, they're nothing but germs and they'll make you sick. At some point around the turn of the millennium, looking for an accessible introduction to biology to teach in my undergraduate literature and science class at Texas Tech, I was browsing the science shelves at Lubbock's Barnes & Noble bookstore, hoping to find something more recent, but in the vein of Lewis Thomas's delightful Lives of a Cell. And what I found was the paperback of the popular science text, What is Life? by Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan. I recollected then that Margulis' science in the early 1970s had been the source of many of Thomas's best zingers. Here was that same exciting science, expanded, updated, and set forth in equally, if not more, glorious expository prose, well primed to influence culture, well beyond the halls of biology departments. Yes, I said to myself, this will do just fine. I began teaching what is life flanked from semester to semester by hard bioscience fictions by authors such as Ursula Le Guin, Bruce Sterling, Octavia Butler, Paul de Filippo, and Joan Slonczewski. What is life gives a brief but straightforward introduction to Gaia theory that was probably my first encounter with an authoritative account of it. However, it doesn't bring Gaia theory forward so emphatically that one must confront it head on. I taught this text for several years, concentrating on its main evolutionary narrative while otherwise sweeping Gaia off into a ne neglected corner. My turning point was catalyzed elsewhere, and this is kind of the kinky part intellectually. It came in the train of developing a parallel interest in Niklas Luhmann's sociological systems theory. Now, Luhmann's work falls into a line of systems theory termed second order cybernetics, in which the concept of autopoiesis that Jim Strick briefly teed me up for this morning, concept of autopoiesis is a primary, if not the premier concept for Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, the Chilean biologists who forged that concept, their initial material instance of an autopoietic system is the living cell. In this formulation, the fundamental processes of life are circular in form. They continuously select and transform the elements in their environmental medium so as to produce their own continuing production of selective transformations. For the theory of autopoiesis, cellular life's self-referential processes amount to cognition or sense-making, what Margulis and Sagan in What Is Life call sentience. And fatefully, Margulis is perhaps the only biological writer other than Maturan and Varela to have, corporated, to have incorporated explicit reference to autopoiesis into popular expositions. Now, Luhmann's sociological theory features a dramatic extension of the concept of autopoiesis beyond its origin in biological systems theory to metabiotic matters of consciousness and communication in psychic and social systems. So, inadvertently working on these diverse dialects of autopoietic systems theory simultaneously, gradually became clear to me that there were crucial links to be made between, on the one hand, the several second-order cybernetic discourses of autopoiesis, and on the other, the evolutionary, symbiogenetic, and Gaian appropriations of the concept presented in Margulis and Sagan. So gripped by this neo-cybernetic enthusiasm, I decided to give my next literature and science class a bio-cybernetic orientation and teach Maturan and Varela's rather amazing book, The Tree of Knowledge. So instead of assigning the relatively lengthy and rigorous What is Life for a biology primer, I went with Margulis's briefer single-authored text of 1998, Symbiotic Planet, preparing it in the summer of 2005, I got around to its final chapter, simply titled Gaia. Here she retells the name of Gaia origin story, but 
with a cautionary twist. And this is Lynn's exposition. The term Gaia was suggested to Lovelock by the novelist William Golding, author of Lord of the Flies. The early 1970s, they both lived in Bower Chalk, Wiltshire, England. Lovelock asked his neighbor whether he could replace the cumbersome phrase, quote, a cybernetic system with homeostatic tendencies as detected by chemical anomalies in the Earth's atmosphere, unquote, with a term meaning Earth. I need a good four-letter word, he said, Lovelock said to Golding. On walks around the countryside in that gorgeous part of southern England near the Chalk Downs, Golding suggested Gaia. The name caught on all too well, unquote, from Margulis. In this text, Margulis, I mean along with expounding Gaia theory, she expresses her concern that Gaia, quote unquote, with all of its extra scientific baggage, along with Lovelock's propensity in popular discussion to personify Gaia as a living being, has exposed the science it covers to severe misconstructions. But then comes the key part of this passage from Symbiotic Planet, the piece that finally made the idea of Gaia click for me. Margulis continues, as detailed in Jim's theory about the planetary system, Gaia is not an organism, unquote. This blunt proposition preps Gaia for metabiotic appreciation while it cuts away from the understanding of Gaia, the fringe metaphysics or planetary vitalisms kept alive, so to speak, by the name of Gaia having itself caught on all too well. In this passage, Margulis points to the scientific details of Lovelock's developed presentation of the theory in order to tether the metaphorics back to the science. Gaia is not an organism. Rather, Gaia is a system, an emergent and metabiotic system within which organisms are elements. And having put the organic metaphor in its proper place, Margulis immediately goes right on to deploy it. Quote from Symbiotic Planet, Gaia, the system, emerges from 10 million or more connected living species that form its incessantly active body, unquote. Well, this subtle but incisive separation of mythopoetic rhetoric from conceptual exposition was my eureka moment. Gaia theory is systems theory. And not only that, in her own later treatments, Gaia theory is second order systems theory. Margulis prepares Gaia for coordination with the suite of autopoietic systems theories also making their paradigm changing way against institutional and ideological headwinds, specifically on a par with psychic and social systems in Luhmann's adaptation of autopoiesis, Gaia is a metabiotic entity, a complex emergent system with its own evolving metadynamics arising from the inextricable interpenetration of the biota with the seas, the skies, and the rocks. What Tyler Volk calls in his wonderful book, Gaia's Body, The Gaian Matrixes. And now I was ready to go back to what is life and construct Margulis and Sagan's phrasings there in their second order cybernetic sense. For instance, quote from What is Life, the biosphere as a whole is autopoietic in the sense that it maintains itself, unquote. And as an autopoietic system in the metabiotic sense, Gaia need not be identified with the forms of life per se. Rather, Gaia shares an essential quality of living systems, the autopoietic form of organization, an emergent recursive form of self-production based on self-referential, self-regulated, self-maintenance that can cross over between biotic and metabiotic formations in connection to 
abiotic environments. Now to finish up, Lynn did not develop the science of autopoietic Gaia. She did not direct her own researches to this topic. However, in the popular expositions of microcosmos and what is life, she puts autopoietic Gaia on the broad cultural table. For her, I think it was at most an inspired hunch. And it was certainly an outcome, a direct outcome of her multiple encounters at Lindisfarne gatherings with Bill Thompson and Francisco Varela as the beautiful Gaia volumes that Bill Thompson edited on the basis of two of those meetings during the 1980s as they show systems theories of biological autonomy and metabiotic autopoiesis were on the agenda there and Lynn surely absorbed them into her own thinking as a result. My own conviction is that Gaia theory going forward needs to pick up autopoietic Gaia from where Margulis left it, but in any event, we can honor the way that Lynn's intellectual presence of mind has been the ballast, I think, that has kept Gaia theory scientifically upright during its adolescence on the cultural stage in her long collaboration with Lovelock. His was perhaps the voice more prone to mercurial pronunciations while hers, Lynn's, was the steadying hand. Thanks. <laughs>